So, hello everyone. Wow. I'm really happy to see you there today. And during this last slot of DevOps Bodge in 2019, we'd like to tell you a story of superheroes and superpowers. So, are there any Marvel superheroes fans? Oh, uh, there, are, there uh, are a lot of. DC? And DC superheroes? Oh, the okay. dark ones. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Why superheroes and superpowers? So, because we think that machine learning is a kind of superpower in computer science world. And every superpower has some origins. And in case of machine learning, this origins lies in math. So today I would like to tell you about math behind machine learning. So my name is Łukasz Gebel, and that's my friend Piotr Szajka. Hello. And we are both software engineers at TomTom, and we're coming from Łódź in Poland. When we work for location and navigation services department, when we build services like matrix routing, geofencing, in general That's services fun. that helps people to be build orient uh, navigation location oriented applications. But today we'll talk about machine learning. So first of all, we'd like to define what is machine learning. So we've got the common view, and then we'll go through two main methods of machine learning types of machine learning, which are supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And of course, in the end, we'd like to answer your questions. So let's start with some simple definitions. First one by Arthur Samuel, who was like a founding father of AI, one of the founding fathers of AI. And according to Mr. Samuel, machine learning is a field of study that gives our computers, our programs, ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And why to do this? So. Sometimes it's quite hard to figure out a cool working algorithm to solve our problems. Because it's not an easy task, for example, to find your friend on a photo. It's, it's quite complex. It's easy for our human eyes, but for computers it's, it's quite hard. And in the picture you can see Arthur Samuel, who is playing checkers with the computer that he built. And this computer was able to learn how to play checkers by playing with human players. And the second definition by one of our lecturers. Um, so when we were studying, we had to implement intelligent methods. And we asked our lecturer, what does it mean that method is intelligent? And he said that he considered every method that needs some kind of training as an intelligent or machine learning method. And he used this intuition that people and animals are usually considered to be intelligent. And we also learn how to solve problems. And we also master the task by learning. So that's machine learning in, in a very general view. Yeah. In a nutshell. Yeah. Right. But it's easy, make your com it's, it's easy to say, make your computer learn. But how to do it? Yeah, you cannot give it a book, right? We cannot give it a book and say, okay, learn. It doesn't work that way. So let's look at the supervised learning. So we can compare supervised learning to being taught by a teacher. So when we were at school, we were la learning all of these different and very difficult problems, like, for example, adding numbers. And our teacher gave us examples. So, for example, example and correct answers. And we learned by examples. So we read them, we understood these examples, we had correct answers, so we could generalize and solve our problems. And the same applies to supervised learning. So first of all, we need to have our student, which will be a mathematical model that will solve our task. Then we need to have our data set, our examples and correct answers. So then we have to present these examples to our model, check how it responds, and then adjust model parameters so it responds correctly. And one of the biggest family of neural networks, uh, of algorithms in machine learning world, are neural networks. And uh, they have really vast number of applications from computer vision and to, to data compression. And they were inspired by biological brain mechanism. So, Let's look at the biological neuron. In this very simple view of our biological neuron, we've got dendrites, our neuron cell, and an axon. So electrical signal from different neurons goes through dendrites to our neuron cell. In our neuron cell, the signals are summed up. And if this sum is bigger than given threshold, our neuron cell produces its own signal. 
which go through an axon to different neurons. And that's how different groups of neurons in our brain affect each other. This intuition was used to build an artificial neuron. And in our artificial neuron, we've got inputs, which are parts of our example. So, for example, the pixel of our image. And every input has weights. And weights are also real numbers. So how does it work? You need to take input, multiply it by corresponding weights, sum it all up, and put this sum into an activation function. And the result of the activation function is the single real number, the single output of our artificial neuron. Typical activation function may look like this. It's called sigmoid. And it's continuous, nonlinear. These features are, are quite useful because then we need some derivatives of this function later. And this one simply maps our sum to the value from 0 to 1, as you can see in the picture. The problem with neural networks is that they are quite hard to understand at the first glance when you are a beginner in this, in this field. So that's the part when linear regression comes to the rescue, because linear regression can be done in a machine learning favor, and we can do it with the very similar algorithm like neural networks. So today we'd like to explain machine learning with the linear regression. So linear regression is a simple method for modeling relationships between variables. So for example, house price versus its size. Okay, we'd like to explain it with the use of real life problems, but we will we'll use the real lives of superheroes. So let's ask ourselves a question. What defines a superhero? Do you have an idea, Piotr? Yeah, maybe those huge bug eyes of, of anime characters. Yeah, so hmm, how is that useful? You can be super cute or what? No, you, you, know, you see better, like the wolf in the little okay. red riding hood. Maybe. I think that costume is quite, quite important. So let's imagine the situation that you're in a comic book issue, a character from a comic book issue, you are surrounded by bad guys, and you are waiting for your superhero to help you. And this guy comes in. So he's not very reliable, let's say. So Happy Puff scenario is that he's like a wounded gazella who will like, attract the predators so we can run away. And the uh, more probable scenario is that uh, now two guys need help. On contrary, we've got original four, who is like super strong, he's got really good armor, a hammer, and he looks helpful. So I think that every superhero needs to invest some amount of money in a good costume. So we did a serious scientific research and we have found out the most published superheroes ever. So for every superhero, we've got a number of comic book issues in which they appeared. And then we checked on eBay how much you have to pay for its costume. So our data looks like this. We've got costume price and number of comic book issues. And now I would like to invest some kind, some amount of money in my costume and predict in how many comic book issues I will appear. You always can learn something interesting from your data. And this time we learned that you have to pay over $100 for the invisible woman costume. And it should be somewhere there. Yeah. And there are two options. Yeah, either it's a brilliant scam and maybe we should invest in that kind of, you know, fooling people. Or it's a really good costume because I cannot see there anything, but we'll leave the decision to you. Okay, let's get back to math and linear regression. So in linear regression, our model that will solve the, uh, solve the problem, the task, is a simple line equation. So we've got two parameters, theta 0 and theta 1. We've got x which is the costume price, and the result of our function f will be the number of comic book issues for a given costume price. So our data looks like this. These are simple 2D points, and our task is to find the line that fits it in an optimal way. Maybe here or here. We want to do this automatically with the linear regression in machine learning favor. So now the crucial part. First of all, we need some objective function. Because in machine learning, you need to know if your model performs well or not. Here we've got this, this function, and it's a simple sum. So we need to take every point from our data set, calculate the value of function f for this x value, subtract the expected value, so y, then square it all up, 
and add to our sum. How does it work in practice? So let's say that for one point from our data set, our function gives us four, and we were expecting two. So we've got four minus two, it's two, two squared, it's four. It means that we need to add four to our overall sum. For a different point, our function may give us one, and we may expect it one. So we've got one minus one, it's zero, zero squared, it's still zero. So we don't need to add anything. So you see this intuition, the less, the better. If the function result matches the expected output, we are zero or close to zero. It means that to find the optimal parameters, we need to minimize our objective function. And we will do this with the gradient descent, a superhero of machine learning algorithms, because the idea of gradient descent is commonly used in much more complex methods, also in neural networks. So it helps us to find the minimum of our objective function. In our case, it will be quite simple because we need to iteratively update the function parameters according to these parameters, uh, to these formulas. So we've got two formulas for theta zero and theta one, and we simply need to subtract alpha rate, which is a small real number, multiplied by these formulas, and these ones are derivatives of our objective function with respect to theta zero and theta one. We've got two parameters, so we can have two derivatives, and the set of derivatives in mathematical world is called gradient. That's why the algorithm is called gradient descent. Why we need derivatives? So derivatives gives us information about how our function is changing. So let's look at the graphical example. So let's say that's our simple, simple objective function. It's a parabola, and it depends only on one theta in this case. And at this point, if I calculate the derivative of this function, it's positive. So in our formula, we'll have minus alpha times positive derivative. Positive, uh, negative times positive gives us negative, so we need to subtract something from our theta. It means we are going to the left. Here the function is still increasing, so we're subtracting again and again until we reach the minimum. For this point, on contrary, derivative will be negative because function is decreasing. So we've got negative alpha times negative derivative. So we've got negative times negative, it means a positive value. So I need to add something to my theta. Adding means we are going to the right. So I go to the right, function is still decreasing, and again, and again, until I reach the minimum. So that's the main idea behind gradient descent and, and learning your algorithm. So we are like walking down the hill in the, our function space. Okay, so now let's use it in practice. I will use uh, Octave, which is a cheap knockoff of MATLAB. Well, it's even better than cheap because it's free. Yeah, actually it's true. So, and it gives us some built-in mathematical apparatus to operate on matrices and so on. So my objective function looks like this. It's our f function, subtract the expected value, and all of it is summed up. And gradient descent algorithm is simple for loop, and this is how we update our data parameters. I've got only one data here because it's a vectorized form, so underneath there are two values in this variable. And our main code, so I simply load our data, x and y, extract them, initialize theta, set alpha to this value, and I will run the gradient descent for 1,000 iterations. I run it, and it should give me optimal theta, I hope. So let's run it now. And here we've got our optimal theta, but it's not very informative, so let's plot result. And here we have our optimal function. So now our superhero or, or we can use it, and let's say that I would like to invest $1,000 in my, in my costume. Now I can take my function, my prediction, and it says that for $1,000 for my costume I should appear in around 8,000 comic book issues, which is a good result. Solving this problem, we also learned something sad about human nature, because you can see that the more you pay, the more popular you are, and that's probably why Batman is so popular. Okay, let's get back to presentation. 
So we know gradient descent, we know the crucial part of machine learning. And linear regression is cool, but it's linear. So let's say that we'd like to distinct Marvel superheroes from DC superheroes. Ideally, if a data would be very simple, we could use linear methods like this. But in real world, data is very complex, it's mixed, it looks like this, and we need nonlinear methods. And that's the part where neural networks comes to the rescue, because neural networks can be nonlinear. So typical simple neural network look like this. So we've got input layer, the, the yellow ones. This neuron simply passes the parts of our examples to the hidden layers, the blue neurons. And here you can see we've got this nonlinear activation function, the sigmoids, and the outputs of hidden layer are inputs to the output layer, the red one, and the output layer produces the final output of our neural network. We also have these green guys with plus one, they are called biases, and they give our function, our neural network, some kind of flexibility while fitting to the solution space. So it can crawl through, through the space. And how to train such neural network? First of all, we need to randomly initialize every weight of every neuron in our neural network. Then we need to present the examples. So we take the first example, we calculate the activation function for the first neuron, for the second one and the third one. Then we pass these results of activation function to the output layer. We also calculate the activation function for the output neuron and we've got our final result of our neural network. And then we can calculate an error. We'll need this error to train the network. So we will use the gradient descent algorithm with a slightly different formulas that will incorporate the derivative of the sigmoid function. But the main idea it's the same that I show you with the linear regression. And when we've got this error, we need to push it backward through the network and using gradient descent, update every weight of every neuron as, as we updated our data parameters in linear regression. But there will be a lot of more numbers to update as neurons can have more weights. So we've got our error and we push it backward through our neural network. And while doing this, we are updating weights of our neurons. And that's how we train the neural network. Okay, so when we finally understood, or at least we thought that we understood how neural networks work, we were quite cocky about it and, and very happy. And then one of our lecturers came and she said something like, come on guys, really, really? These are, it's not magic. It's neural networks can do magical things, but underneath there is only a math. And it's like randomized optimization that was already in 60s, 50s, yeah. It's nothing new, yeah, really. You can do it on a piece of paper if you like. Yeah, and she could do this on yeah. a piece of paper. So that's true. So there is no magic behind machine learning. It's more or less complex math, but still we think it can do rocket science, rocket science uh, things. So it's really cool. Okay. So now I said that our neural networks can be nonlinear and they can solve nonlinear problems. So let's generate a true superhero logo with the use of neural network because we know how much we need to invest in our costume and every super logo every superhero needs a super logo because logos are usually nonlinear like this iron man logo i will try to generate one with the use of neural network so i will switch to octave once again and to my neural network code and now i will use also 2d points so uh, it should be plot grid. It will be a grid of 2D points, our data set, training data set. And every point will have a label. So we've got X, we've got Ys, and we've got labels. And labels will be 1 or 0. And then I will draw points with different colors. So 1s will have different colors from zeros. And I prepared this, this data so it should reflect some superhero logo. And I hope my neural network will learn it correctly, but we will see. Okay, and my code looks like this. So I simply extract X and Y from my logo points. 
I will train my neural network for 1,000 iterations, and I will use 200 hidden neurons and only one output neuron, So I, because I just want to have one or zero. So here is the training, and then I will take the whole input again and put these examples to the already trained neural network, so it can generate the labels, so I can check if it's correct or no. Okay, so let's run the code, generate logo, and now all of this gradient descent stuff, activation function calculation is happening. Magic. Yeah, and it's already trained. So now let's plot our data. So I get input and predicted values. And no, 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 no. Yeah. So our neural network learned how to distinguish points that are inside, let's say, Batman equation from the points that are outside of it. And that's, that's what I wanted. That's how I prepared data. So it did a good job. But there are two problems. Yeah, first, the logo is taken. Yeah, so we cannot use it because Batman is quite rich. And, and the second problem is that my neural network did a really good job, but on a data that it already seen during the training process. So it's like learning by heart. I, I wouldn't need to use neural networks. I could remember just map point to the label and draw it without this fancy machine learning stuff. So now let's check how it behaves on the data that wasn't present during the training process. So I prepared a much thicker grid of points. It's like 20, 25,000 points, and in our training set I had only 600 points. So the probability that the point wasn't in the, in the training set is, is really high. Uh, and my thicker grid looks like this, so I don't have labels. I have just points, and I want my trained neural network to generate the labels for me. So I've got this generate true superhero logo code. It simply loads these points, extract X and Y for, from the first and from the second column, and then our neural network predicts the labels, and I will draw them. So let's run the true superhero code, and here it is and plot it. You see it's much more thick. And ta-da! We've got our flying squirrel man logo. Yeah, maybe elephant man with a short trunk. Yeah, or maybe some eagle in Egyptian style, something yeah. like this, maybe. So, as you can see, it's not perfect Batman logo anymore. And that's what we like to show you also, because machine learning usually won't give you the perfect perfect answers. If you could get the perfect algorithm, you probably wouldn't use machine learning. So the wings should be more, more rounded, we lost bad ears, and we could probably fix it by uh, to do some tricks and tweaks with parameters, by adding more training data and so on. But this, this example depicts how machine learning really works. And still, it's a very simple method very simple neural network, but it was able to reflect the very non very complex nonlinear space. Maybe not very, but nonlinear nonlinear space. Okay, so that's it for supervised learning. And now Piotr will tell you what happens when there is no teacher in a classroom. Yes, that's right. Thank you. So we'll look now at unsupervised learning, which is something that might sound cool, but on the other hand, it's not what you have seen yesterday in the movie, so no, no Skynet. It's really the opposite of Skynet because it's focused on one thing only. Uh, so if it's so one directional, why would we even use it? So first of all, it's, we can say a step back from what Lukas showed you because uh, he was showing you when the teacher was around and showing you the good examples. And this is more like uh, seeing the world and trying to find heads and tails out of it. So basically trying to find similarities between stuff that we are feeding our neural network. And that's the basic idea. We want to group stuff. Uh, and well, it is crucial uh, the, how we present those sample data. So, to give you an idea, there was a scientific study about how language uh, interacts with the way we think. 
and children from all around the world were taken into consideration and showed this picture with cow, a chicken and some grass and asked the question, because obviously we're asking that kind of questions to children, what doesn't fit? And let's say uh, Western children said that grass doesn't fit. Be why? Because chicken and cow are animals and the grass is a plant, so it's something different. But Eastern culture had something other in mind. They said that, well, chicken doesn't fit, because obviously cow eats grass, and chicken doesn't eat grass, it doesn't eat cows. Well, well, it doesn't work the other way around, so it's not eaten by cows or grass, or maybe when it dies, but <laughs> not, not actively. So if you hear how, how this stuff is connected, you see that both answers are in fact right, so you must remember that the way you show your data will impact the way how this data will be grouped. And we said we'll be grouping stuff. So why would we even bother if you have this almost perfect way of, of teaching with a teacher? So sometimes well, we're just people and sometimes we don't know nothing about our data and we want the, our computer to give us a glimpse into that data because we can think in one, two, three dimensions, we can draw that stuff, we can make simulations, but going into fourth, fifth and other dimensions, it's ridiculous, it's very hard, maybe some people can do it, maybe they just say they can. Uh, so. We use this unsupervised learning when we want to uh, look into the data that is very uniform and we can't find the key, or when everything is so unique that maybe every sample is its own group. Okay, so the first person who thought about using unsupervised learning was Professor Donald O'Hab, who was a professor in biology. But he was working at the same time the first neural networks were created and of course he was super interested because why, why wouldn't he? So he was working on the normal brains and now there are those wacky scientists who are creating an artificial brain. So of course he was interested and he thought that if a natural brain lands in such a manner that if a signal comes to a neuron uh, and it responds to that signal then and the next time the similar signal comes, it responds with a slightly bigger force. And so the first simple Hebian learning algorithm was born. And as you can see, now the change in weights is not checked by an error. It's just a uh, linear multiplication of a learning step, input to the weight and output of the whole neuron. So we're taking into consideration that the neuron responded. And you probably see that it goes very into very high numbers. Uh, so did the professor. So he created the generalized Hebian learning algorithm when he said that, okay, it's a kind of function that we, between input and output. And you just have to choose whatever fits you best. But we'll be sticking to the simple Hebian learning algorithm because although it is simple, we'll see that it gives us some results. Okay, so how it looks in real life. We have the neuron that you saw, saw before, uh, but instead of uh, back propagation, we have this nifty uh, module down that just updates our weights. So we start with a neuron with some weights uh, randomized, the input is coming into it, so we multiply it, we sum those values up and push it through the activation function of the output layer. We have some value that we then put back to the uh, learning module, we take the input and generate those uh, updates to all the weights. So it's ready for the next sample to be shown. Okay, so let's see how it works. But first, so we have a superhero, we have a logo, uh, maybe we need a superhero team. So, you know, superhero teams are fun and we should all join them. But uh, we see a problem with them because you know, they are not really created uh, to be optimal. We have Captain America who knows a lot about fighting. We have Tony Stark, so Iron Man, who shoots uh, laser beams out of his hands. We have Hulk, who is strong. And we have Thor, who basically does the same thing because he is strong like Hulk. He, he can summon lightning to strike his enemies, so it's a bit similar to what Stark does. And you know, basically he's the god of war, so he knows all about fighting. So maybe there is a problem because superheroes don't see that they're similar to one another. 
And if we want to join some team, it's the best to create a team of our own. So we decided to get some superheroes and see which superheroes are similar to another. So we will group them into, we will have four groups. So we'll group them into four groups. And maybe then we can take one superhero from each group and create a kind of optimal squad so or something. Do I understand correctly that you want to build some kind of super duper squad like in a Deadpool 2? Yeah. Yeah, cool. something like that. And to do that, uh, so we need a representation of our superheroes. So we took data from Marvel database, and the guys there uh, described every superhero using those six values. And it's very convenient because we can use those to create the unique vectors that describe those superheroes. Of course, uh, we won't take into consideration their core superpowers, but we will see, on general, what's, wh what it is about. So, let's go back to Octave. Uh, I will just go to my part and I will show you those superheroes once again. So, you can see those vectors and they are divided by seven. So, that's called normalization because those neural networks work best if you have values between zero and one. And we know that the maximum value in uh, those superpowers is seven, so we can easily do it like, like this here. So I will just load this stuff and show you our Hebian learning. So it's pretty trivial because we're using the same neurons as we used for supervised learning. So to the learning vector, to, to our uh, sample, we're adding bias. And using this matrix technology, uh, we're just multiplying uh, all the weights of all the neurons by our input. Uh, we're summing it up, pushing it through sigmoid, and then we're taking the winner. So this is used mainly because we want to see which neuron responds for which superhero. So then we will have those columns, and one means the superhero's, superhero belongs to the given group, and, and zero that it doesn't. And the winner is the guy that responds with the bigger because, force? Yes, yeah. that's true. Uh, and then we update the weights using the algorithm you saw before. So pretty easy. Uh, we will show those superheroes 100 times. And as we said earlier, uh, this learning process grows really goes into really high numbers. So we're using very, very small learning step to fight that. And let's see how it works. And as you can see, we have three, two groups, really. So the second and fourth neuron responded. Um, I would like to dazzle you and say, oh, I'm surprised, but not really, uh, because I know what are the limitations of this method. Uh, and I wasn't really putting much attention to the parameters. So even if I run it several more times, you will see that we will have better or worse, but still not very satisfying outputs. So I will, okay, so we have two groups. I won't meddle with that anymore. <laughs> so you see that, well, it's not what we intended. So, of course, why? Because those weights go to infinity, and you can really see how much this random uh, initialization uh, puts effort here to change our output. So maybe those groups are similar, but, well, it's unstable. So we can do something to fix it. And to fix it, we'll give it some more freedom. Because now we'll go to self-organizing networks, which is another way of uh, that, uh, that kind of learning. Uh, we won't let them unionize, but they will have some freedom, so to say. But now we won't use, well, classical neurons. We will leave just this weights vector that will be a kind of agent. We can still call them neurons, but they will be more like agents now that are trying to become a everyman of a group they represent. So the basic idea is to change this weights vector in such a manner that it is the closest vector from all the other neurons, uh, that is the closest to all the examples it represents. So it creates a kind of group around it itself. And it can be done in two ways. So there is a winner takes all algorithm, which says that, okay, we see which one performs the best, which is the most similar to the sample, and we let it change those weights. Or winner takes most, uh, in which we create a kind of ranking, so from the best to worst, and every neuron has some ability to learn, but the further away from the example it is, the, the less it learns. So, to give you an idea how it looks, if we have a neuron and an example, 
we calculate a partial distance between each of the values, and we use those partial distances to create to, to calculate the distance. So we use Euclidean distance, you can use whatever you like. Euclidean is just very, very fitting here. And let's say that square root of five is the closest distance. So then we create this learning step, which is just learning coefficient times partial distance, and we subtract it from the original neuron weights. So it becomes a little more similar to, to the example. And we run our uh, learning again. So to give you something more, more uh, visual, if we are to group those superhero logos by color, those neurons in the middle, they will be moving around the solution space until they find a niche from which they don't move as much now. So this is the sign that they have formed, they, they became those every man, they formed groups. Okay, so let's come back to our superheroes again and see if using winner takes all or winner takes most fixed something. So for winner takes all, we have quite different algorithm than for heavy on learning because we're taking, of course, the learning vector, but now we're just uh, calculating our distance and this winner neuron, the uh, winner uh, vector that we were using previously just to show uh, our um, output will be used in learning. So now we can ensure that uh, the best neuron is the only one that will be learned and the others, because they have zeros, uh, they won't learn at all. And for the winner takes most, well, as you can see, it's pretty similar to winner takes all, but now we're creating this neighborhood. So we're using exponential function that takes the distance into consideration to see, to, to, to create that ranking from the best to the worst. And now we use that instead of just ones and zeros to uh, change the, the learning speed of our neurons. And let's just quickly look into winner takes most testing. So we'll be teaching our superheroes uh, 100 times once again, but the uh, learning step is a bit higher because it is more stable. So let's we'll just run it and see, we have four groups now, which is cool. I see that some groups aren't very nifty, but you will see that it's common that it's fixed now. It's a little better, so the third group now is out, but more or less it goes into well good direction. Okay, so let's let's stop it now, maybe, and I will show you winner takes most, which should give us more uniform and nicer groups, and and it does. Uh, we shouldn't have those zero values columns at all. But okay, now we can see that we just divided the superheroes in some way. But how do we prove that this division is sane in any way? So we can add our superhero to the list. And although we would love to have it uh, you know, generated somehow, we think that you know, always be yourself, but if you can be Batman, just be Batman. So we will add to those DC superheroes, Batman and see in which groups he lands. Okay, I will just load winner takes all and winner takes most too. And see what groups Batman is assigned to. Okay, so it's the third group and for winner takes all and winner takes most, it's the fourth group. Okay, so let's just scroll back to Hebian learning. Okay, that's the last one. Okay, so he landed in the biggest group. So obviously there are two groups, so uh, th there wasn't much to, to debate here. So we see Iron Man, Spider-Man, Black Panther, Wolverine, basically Captain America, Incredible Hulk, and all those street-level superheroes like The Thing, Luke Cage, and Mrs. Marvel, and so on. Uh, so let's see how it looks with those slightly better algorithms. So winner takes all. Again, Spider-Man, Black Panther, Doctor Strange, Mr. Fantastic. Uh, so it's nice. We have uh, we have met at least some of uh, of the stuff. And well, for winner takes most, we have only Captain America matching. So 
Well, it could be better, but still you can see that it found those similarities between Captain America and Batman and mm, divided using these. So maybe if we put more effort into selecting parameters, we could get consistent and better results. But still, you can see that the idea still works. Uh, and we see winner takes all and winner takes most work much, much better than heavy and learning. But at the same time, they still have some downsides. First of all, in winner takes all, if we have a situation that all our neurons uh, have their weights generated in such a manner that they land in one cluster, in one place, and all of our samples are in a cluster in another place, it's very probable that only one neuron will learn. And it is fixed in winner takes most, but then we will have to implement a kind of uh, Mm, elastic, flexible way of uh, mm, e adding epochs because it will take a lot of time to drag those missing neurons back. So, to the Finnish. Yes, because incidentally, this man is from Finland. He fixed that issue and he's called Professor Tuevo Kohonen. He created something called self organizing map. And although it sounds completely different, it's just a mix on a twist on winner takes most algorithm. Because now we don't create that ranking, it's not generated, it's fixed, and it looks like this, or better, like this. So we have that grid of points that we're trying to drag on our solution space, on our sample set that we're feeding our neural network. And when we do this, we try to cover it as tightly as we can, so every neuron finds its niche, and hopefully uh, we have the best probability that those niches are uniform, and at the same time that all these neurons have their own niche. Because in winner takes most, it's still not perfect. So it's like covering the solution space with a blanket, yeah? Yes, exactly like that. And to wrap, wrap all that stuff up. So what we've shown you is just the basic stuff that lies underneath most of the modern mm, machine learning. And as you can see, it's still really randomized optimization, which can give you local optimums. But that's up to you, because sometimes uh, this good enough is just what you need. Uh, all you need to do is design your objective function in such a manner that it implements everything that you want from your model. Because then you will get exactly that. You won't get the perfect stuff that will do everything. But on one hand, you might not really need that, or it might be not possible to then utilize that super model. So sometimes good enough is really yeah. the best. Is that what you can afford? That's true. And well, we're coming to an end. Uh, you can find our presentation under the link uh, from the first bullet point. We will also put it on our Twitters. Uh, there is a course on Coursera for machine learning, which uses also Active, uh, and it's free. The second one for deep learning is a bit, uh, you need to pay, but you can see the videos for free. You can also check those trainings from Amazon and a lot of nice books that we have here. And what's and more? If uh, you have any questions now, that's the time, or you yeah. can go to us and, and feel free to talk to us after the presentation. We'll be around the venue. Yeah, for, for at least some time. Yeah. Still. So we'd also like to ask you to rate our presentation because we really appreciate your feedback. And that's all for now. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.